Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So we are about to start the next session. I'm Gora Saxena. On behalf of Griha Council, would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you uh, for the session on water stress, perplexing possibilities. This session intends to deliberate on the challenges, probable solutions to ensure rapid dissemination, appropriate adaptation of water resource management in the built environment, which is key to strengthen the water security. Water scarcity affects more than 40% of people around the world, an alarming figure that is projected to increase with the rise in the global temperatures. Qualitative and quantitative water stress results in increasing droughts, declining quality of groundwater and unabated flooding. Therefore, effective sustainable management of water resources in order to increase water supply and manage demand under stressed water availability conditions is essential to sustainable development. On that note, I would request our esteemed panelist to be on the dais, Professor Greg Leslie, Acting Director of the UNSW Global Water Institute and Director of the UNESCO Center for Memory and Science and Technologies. Dr. Arun Kansal, yeah, a round of applause would be good. Dr. Arun Kansal, Dean Research and Relationships and Head of Department of Regional Water Studies at Terry University. Ms. Tushara Shankar, GM, Head, CSR at United Breweries Limited. Professor Hina Zia, Department of Architecture, Jamia Millia Islamia University. Let's extend a warm welcome. I would now like to take the opportunity of introducing Professor Greg Leslie, the moderator of the session. Professor Leslie uh, is, has, uh, prior to joining UNSW, has worked in uh, the public and private sector on water treatment, reuse and desalination projects in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong and United States. He served on the World Health Organization Technical Committee that developed guidelines for desalination, the Water Issue Committee for the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council and the Independent Advisory Panel for the Orange County Groundwater Replenishment. I would request Professor Leslie to deliver the thematic address. Ladies and gentlemen and organisers of GRIA, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you uh, today. I'll just bring up the slides somehow. Oops. There we go. Oops. So while, that's, uh, while the slides are coming up, there's uh, four of us who will speak today and we'll cover a range of issues from the engineering about managing for uncertainty and securing urban water supplies to some of the social and assumptions that are made on uh, how we organise or we do planning for water sustainability, uh, some of the social dimensions and how water scarcity affects industries and then we'll open it up for, for discussion. So um, our, our title today was Water Stress Perplexing Possibilities. And I've tried to frame that around two basic questions. Um, the first of all is we're dealing with um, in uncertainty in what I would refer to as our climate dependent water sources. The sources of water we've traditionally got used to, be they surface water or groundwater. And what we've got to do is we need to secure new water supplies that are independent of climate. But the challenge is how do we do that without exacerbating the factors that are causing climate change to begin with? And that's basically the carbon intensity of our different sources of water. The second part that we'll see if we we'll have time to get to um, is we have an urban environment, but we also have a lot of people that live outside the urban environment that aren't as well served by the basic infrastructure um, that, that supplies power, water, and so how do we begin to, to, to create systems that allow them to become empowered and to take control of their water resources? And underpinning that is things on behaviour, the role of industry, uh, and some of the assumptions. So that's what we'll cover today. A very quick advertisement 
I am the director of uh, UNSW's Global Water Institute. It's an institute that's cross-faculty. It represents the faculties of medicine, arts and social science, law, science and engineering. Uh, it's been very much part of the DNA of the University of New South Wales since we were founded in 1949. Um, water resources, hydraulics, ecology, microbiology, chemical engineering, um, have all been a strong focus, and that's been amplified over the last decade or so with expertise in public health, in the water, sanitation and hygiene, but also in um, the role that social change plays and understanding that, the human geography aspect, and also reforms in the legal sector. Australia is very well known for reforming the way water is managed. In Australia now, water title, your ownership of water is now decoupled from your ownership of land. So it's now possible to trade water. A farmer may decide to leave water in a river because they will get more by selling that water than using it for anything that they could grow and it would flow downstream. That creates a market and allows the government to step into the market and say we will take that water and put it to environmental use to protect wetlands, to recharge aquifers. And they can do that without having, the, having to compulsorily acquire the land to get the title of the water. So those reforms uh, began in around about 1990. They were promulgated into law in the Water Act in 2007, and then finally codified in 2012. So it was a bit of a journey, but it has given the government more flexibility and the, and the, the owners of water more flexibility to, to deal with it. But, um, we'll, and we'll not pick that up in the conversation, but today I really wanted to talk to you about that first question. How do we secure urban water supplies in an uncertain climate? Most of the climate is impacted by two factors. Um, the first is the duration between high intensity rainfall events is getting longer, uh, meaning that we have less reliable runoff from our, into our dams and less reliable recharge of our aquifers. The other flip side to that is when the rain does come, it's in a shorter, more intense period, which is putting stress on our flood management, on our urban space, and the water is, is not being captured and is running off. So we really need to rethink that. Now, in Australia, the response to that during what was called the millennium drought, seven years of below average rainfall, was to build a lot of desalination plants. There's a photo of the standard reverse osmosis, which is the, uh, which is the benchmark. And so if we have a look at a map of Australia, our populations are concentrated around the coast in coastal cities. And in a period of five years, from 2005 to 2010, our installed desalination capacity went from 45 gigalitres per annum to over 500 gigalitres per annum. And that was on the back of those six very big desalination plants. In Perth, for example, um, those two plants now are providing up to uh, about a third of the city's water supply, totally dependent on desalination. Now, the impact of that has been an increase in the power demand. When those plants run, the total load is around about 260 to 280 megawatts of additional load placed on the, on the, um, on, on the system. Now the water that's produced from a lot of these plants gets distributed through the regular uh, water distribution system. It finishes up as waste. And so on the back of that, the wastewater treatment plants, a lot of them are being retrofitted with the same technology, membranes, to recycle the water. In the case of Perth, there's a, the Woodman Point plant there, which is uh, on the west of Australia. That water is captured, treated, and re-injected into the aquifer to be used later. So that there are examples of, of how reuse is being um, uh, deployed. Similarly, um, and uh, uh, Tashura will talk about this later, um, it's also being used directly to supply industries. And over in Perth, they have a range of uh, refineries there, BP. They have a, um, a high smelt refinery and a Rio Tinto refinery that does some copper, uh, sorry, that does some uh, lead, I think, um, that are taking that water directly. So they're, they're the two bookends. But the question we've got is how do we begin to mitigate the carbon intensity of those? And if you look at the cost to run these plants, 
desalination and reuse bookend quite nicely the range of costs associated with these new climate independent sources of water. Now this is an old slide because um, I was, when we did these calculations we only ran up to 20 cents a kilowatt hour and I think as Alastair touched on this morning or yesterday that we're now paying closer to 30 to 40 cents a kilowatt hour so the prices are, uh, are moving along. But the, the top line, the blue line, is the um, operation costs of desalination, ranging from around about uh, 35 up to about 90 cents um, a cubic metre or 1,000 litres. And at the bottom, what bookends it is the, the reuse. Now, the reason those lines are quite different is the seawater is very salty, 36,000 milligrams per litre on average. Wastewater, less salty, about 1,000 to 1,500 on average. And the, the, the higher the salt, the more energy we need to put in to produce the clean water. So that's sort of the range, and the gap is getting bigger. But we, we, we don't only just look at the power intensity, we also have to think about what, what we refer to as the embodied energy. And we begin to break this down by looking at the CO2 um, per cubic metre equivalents of these two different schemes. Now you can see that in both the desalination and the recycling it's dominated by power, but there are other embodied costs in there. There's a lot of chemicals that go into the systems, particularly in desal to remove boron. Boron is one of those molecules that doesn't come out particularly well, um, but at elevated concentrations it's, it's harmful to plants and to an extent to people. So we need to adjust pH and that takes a lot of uh, caustic soda and caustic soda is a very carbon intense chemical around about a, a tonne of carbon dioxide per tonne of, carb, of caustic soda. There's also the plastic membranes, and they are derived from fossil fuels. A dipic acid, which is converted into a nylon-like molecule, which con is converted into polyamide, which is the backbone of all these desal plants that are being built around the world. So there's a carbon intensity in there. And so it doesn't make sense to install either desal or reuse unless we're doing other things. And those other things are um, stormwater harvesting. Here's a, we've, cricket has obviously been a bit of a theme since our Vice-Chancellor's talk the other morning and people have referred to it. And India is, of course, winning the cricket in Australia at the moment, so that can only be a good thing. Here's a photo of uh, the cricket ground at the University of New South Wales. And um, at the bottom there is a renovation that was done to the cricket ground. About a third of the area was removed and a constructed um, uh, material, a load-bearing material um, that looks like a very large milk crate was installed. It was covered in a geotextile fabric. It was backfilled with sand. It becomes a water sink. And then it was covered over, and you can see the cricket ground at the university is right at the bottom. And so when it rained, it would flood. And that flooding was getting worse as the rain intensity was increasing. But now since we've installed that, that rain is captured and sinks very quickly. And you can stand there on a really wet day now and you do not see the water pool at all. It rapidly gets down into the ground. And so that water that's trapped in there is now the only source of water that the utilities at the university use to do all the gardening and all the watering and keep it green. And when you, um, when you now compare the carbon intensity of that reuse water to those other two options, you see that it's, it's, um, it's around about a, a fifth of the, uh, well, actually a tenth almost, of the, uh, of the carbon intensity of the reuse, which in turn is um, around about a quarter of the carbon intensity of desal. So we need to maximise the amount of low carbon water options first. So that's stormwater recovery. Very, very easy, low hanging fruit water-sensitive urban design. Then we build on the back of that the reuse, and once that's in place, that's when we start adding the desal. We don't go to the desal first, because it's the most expensive, the most carbon-intensive form. And those lessons have come from the building industry. If you think to what's happened with lighting, we've gone from incandescent to fluorescent light bulbs, which the fluorescence operated about a fifth of the power draw of the incandescence. And now we've moved to the LEDs that use typically around about a, a half to a third of the power draw of the incandescence. 
So if we think about other uses of water in the house, we really have to start targeting the high embodied energy water uses. And the obvious one is heating. Now, the number that I showed you at the start on the map of Australia talked about um, 280 megawatts of installed power to run all of those desalination plants. The next calculation shows if we look at the installed capacity of electric hot water systems in Australia, and here it is here, it's based on um, a total of, uh, was it three, and my glasses on, um, about 300, 3 million um, equivalent domicile units, so single dwelling houses in Australia, um, located in those cities, if we were just to replace 1.5% of the electric hot water heaters in those houses, we would offset the amount of power that we're using to run the desal plant. So there's lots of levers we can pull in the water sector. Um, but really, if you don't have proper planning and you're not cognizant of how the water is being used, the amount of carbon that we're emitting by creating solutions to deal with the problems associated with climate change and carbon emissions is only going to go in the wrong direction. So to answer the first question is we need to maximise stormwater capture where possible. Urban design is key there. Um, the second thing is that we need good design within our homes to minimise the, the amount of water that's being used and also to minimise the amount of energy that's going into heating the water, because that's the biggest drain. The new sources of water that we bring in, desal should be the last, because it tends to be the highest power, but we need to then work on our wastewater treatment to make sure we've got the ability to capture the wastewater to recycle it to realise those savings. I'm, I might just very quickly, um, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, so Hina will go next and, and talk about some of the underpinning assumptions into our calculations. Um, and then I'll pass on to Arun and uh, to Shara. But uh, I, I just want to talk about a project that we've been very lucky to do closer to home with the Tata Foundation in Gujarat. And it deals with the kidney stone issue. So not the chronic kidney disease, but the, um, the acute uh, short-term disease associated with the accumulation of stones. And um, really what we're looking at there is how do, we, how do we take these systems that are dependent upon a certain amount of institutional and community capacity um, that really is not there in those communities? You know, it's hard to install a desal plant. Um, for the community in, in one of the communities in Gujarat, that red zone there is the area of the groundwater that's very high in salt and the salt is implicated in the accumulation of the um, urelic acid and the, uh, the development of the stones. And um, the current solution that they have is to import desalination technology, but if in some of the villages, that is the major infrastructure. And it's, it's very much removed from the capacity of the community to operate it. Similarly, the people, mostly women, still have to walk four to five kilometres every day to get the water. So it, it's, it, it's not the right... The, the things that we do in the cities aren't necessarily the right solutions in the countryside. And so what we worked with, and we were sort of inspired a little bit by Tata's products, was to design desalination equipment that is very, very simple to operate. It, systems that don't require all of the, the high-end pre-treatment very basic systems that run off a platform that is essentially a truck. A truck is a motor, and a pump is a motor and a pump head. That's all you need to run desal. And if you design it in such a way, the truck still functions as a truck. It doesn't have to take up the whole capacity. And so we, using that premise, we designed a system that is very low profile. Are we good? The, uh, it's very low profile, um, we reduce the weight of it, the engine provides the motive force, and then you can begin to build it into social enterprise models, where a farmer, artisans, people that have products that need to get to market can use access to the truck to get their goods to market while the truck is in the village it can treat the salty groundwater locally, remove the salt, 
to help mitigate the kidney disease. And so these are, this again is not technology, it's design thinking. It's thinking about what problem do we have to solve and applying the technology appropriately. So with that, um, I'll, uh, I'll leave it and then I'll call on Hina to, uh, to begin to discuss the underlying assumptions. Might need some hand to get out of the, uh, the presentation. Oops. How do we stop it? Ah, you're a star. Thank you for the warning. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful discussion. I would now request Dr. Professor Hina Zia, Department of Architecture, Jamia Millia Islamia. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly introduce her first. Qualified as an architect, an urban planner, and rural planner, she has built her career in a variety of roles. Her specific interest lies in trying to find implant, uh, implementable solutions and business models on issues pertaining to growing urbanization. So I would request ma'am to please proceed. Can somebody help me with this? I'm going to start with uh, the first question which Greg very well uh, put up in the context of Australia, uh, which is uh, uh, which is uh, the title looks a little scary. I thought water stress is a scary thing and uh, come May, June and everybody is like, oh, whether we are going to get tomorrow's supply or not, especially in metros and mega cities. But right now, with the kind of audience I see that people are a lot bothered because this is not the time when we are facing the stress. It's usually peak. It, the peak is seen in uh, or felt in, in summers. So uh, given the kind of condition we are in, and especially uh, uh, coming from a developing country, a very highly dense country like India, uh, water is a big, big, we are in real big trouble. And uh, our recent political elections, uh, the, yesterday we, the results came for three states, which was unexpected that the ruling party lost uh, and remotely related to the deep distress which the farmers face. And uh, a major part of the problem is connected to none other than water. So that's the reason why I put it as, is apocalypse real? And I'm, that doesn't mean that I am a, I'm, I am not an optimist. I believe that we do have the wherewithal and the knowledge and the wisdom to revive in our own context. Uh, two photographs, this is what? This is Carol. And what surprised me is that it was, it had two times, it declared two times drought in the preceding year, which is, which is 2017, and it got the worst of floods not seen in 25 years in 2018. So then we had the, uh, these stories from Shimla, and uh, uh, wherein and during the peak tourist season, tourists were warned not to come to that uh, place because there was a real scarcity of water. and. Uh, then there was a lot of media coverage on the likely uh, situation, similar situation likely to happen in none other than Delhi and Bangalore and uh, many other such cities. So at the time of the crisis in J June 2018, these were the headlines which were moving on internationally, Times, Independent, all was pointing out to this. Uh, same year, in, in the month of uh, uh, June again, this very important report, which was on composite water management index, it came out by none other than Niti Aayog, which is the new avatar of what we, know, we are used to have called uh, planning commission. And uh, the news is not at all happy, and it clearly states that Scarcity is on the horizon, especially for Indian, Indian cities, larger cities, big cities. 21 cities, including New Delhi and uh, all the big metros, will run out of groundwater by 2020, and it's very close, affecting 100 million people. 
40% of the population will have no access to drinking water by 2030. So news is not, not at all uh, happy. And, but uh, we Indians also have a, we, we, we are sort of in a state of amnesia every now and then. There was a lot of media coverage and then suddenly water stress is out of the radar and we are not yet planning and doing enough to, to uh, uh, look at the problem. Now when combine that with the climate change implications and the October report on uh, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees C clearly states that we have reached the thresholds globally and there is not enough time to even contain the temperature to less than, uh, or rather to two degrees centigrade. And even if there is a two degree C scenario, particularly in a context of India, uh, we will have a large, lot of uh, implications in the form of floods, droughts, scarcity, decrease in food production, and exposing a greater pop proportion of an already vulnerable population to poverty, food, and livelihood insecurity. So now the, let's figure out the real problem. Were we always like this? And uh, what Greg just talked about, the new ways of doing water-sensitive design and uh, stormwater management in particular, devising large storage structures, we had always been doing just about 100 years ago. The structures are still intact, many of them. And the last uh, counting in 1985-86, uh, we had, by which time many lakhs of tanks or similar water harvesting structures were already defunct. That time we had a number called about 15 lakhs tanks, which is huge, 1.5 million. And uh, so we, and it was, it was a system which was bottom-up and not top-bottom. It was each an individual's responsibility, as well as then it moved to the society level, and then it moved to the governance system, which was the kingdom and uh, under various rulers. So we had been doing and practicing it till the current governance system came in, which said, you don't have to bother about anything. We'll take care. And therein we... Therein lies the root of problem which we are facing now. So from being frugal to a wasteful modern society, that's the true facet of the current Indian society. Uh, this is uh, taken from the uh, CSE report, and it just states what it highlights is status of water bodies in India, and there are three layers to it. So uh, it, it's, the number states how many flood that places uh, has seen in, 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 the, in just one year. Uh, then uh, the quarter or the semicircles, the, the, the darkest blue shade actually reflects how much of the water bodies have already been acquired or defunct. So you see in all the major cities, there's the same trend, either there's a half full circle or it's already three quarter is covered, which means that the status of water bodies, which have been either man-made or uh, naturally built, uh, they are all defunct or lying. So we have huge infrastructure which is lying, which is all water sensitive design, or you call it SADS, you call it in modern language by different uh, uh, names. They have been there, they are still there. Most of them are still there. Uh, this just shows that alarming figure again till 2017. We had um, just a couple of three years. In three years, we had uh, millions of victims thanks to. Uh, water stress, uh, stress problems, um, and this is going to continue if you don't take the right steps at all levels. So traditional water economy to modern water economy is inevitable. Now we have been a traditionally agriculture society, all of us know that, uh, whereas the difference between a traditional uh, agriculture-based water economy and the other modern economies is there. Uh, we consume 70 percent, roughly 70 percent of our water goes is meant for agriculture, and then 30 percent is meant for households and industry, etc. And the reverse is there for modern economies, which is like 30 percent is just for agriculture and 70 percent for the other. Now, as we are industrializing, as we our economy is growing, this this transition is inevitable. So our but. Uh, with the same amount of quantum of water, but at the same time, the industries are growing. Agriculture is still there. We are still a traditionally agriculture, agro-based at least economy. 
uh, we don't have that much of water. So now the transformation, we have a choice. What should be this transformation power path? Because this is inevitable. And are there any real models to emulate? Or should we have our own hybrid version, which is very well rooted to the, the kind of infrastructure, the basic knowledge, traditional knowledge system we already had? And let's combine. So, so there are two options. Either we just copy paste thing and we do it in our own context, or we follow something new. Uh, this is an excellent example. This is taken from Anupam Mishra ji's book. This is a sketch, but this is coming from one of the arid regions. This is a man-made water harvesting structures found in the remotest arid region of the country where you hardly get not more than 100 mm rainfall in a year. And if you see, why I had written behavioral science is that uh, th this was a time of no WhatsApp, no... Uh, you don't have such means of communication. So the, this beautiful uh, artifacts, what you see, uh, positioning of uh, uh, an elephant or a horse meant something for the society, which means, say for instance, if your elephant is, has started, is visible, this means this is an indication for the entire village that this is a time when you should really be very, very uh, frugal about water use. So everybody is like on their toes, what they have to crop, uh, how frugal they have to be in their overall consumption. Now, this is an example which is still there. We have a huge, that's what I come, come back again and again, that we have a huge uh, traditional uh, wisdom lying right in the most arid regions, and if that is replicated throughout the country and if we revive the same, uh, we, uh, we are like much ahead when it comes to water-sensitive design, so to say. Uh, another uh, thing which, again, it's, it's coming from Anubam Mishraji's book. He was a pure Gandhian and uh, unfortunately passed away in 2017. And uh, you see that uh, it's very well written that what it means is, if for those who don't understand Hindi, uh, that says that uh, uh, this plethora of huge man-made uh, multiple scales and multiple examples of these storage structures for stormwater management, uh, these... There, there was a force who were uh, sort of facilitating the building up, and 10 times more there was a workforce which was actually building it and maintaining it. And that's what led to matrix of developing and maintaining water systems by the society for the society. So that was the kind of system we used to follow. And uh, very interestingly, SAR means in Hindi, it means uh, water storage harvesting structures, which could be of different typologies. We have a whole system of these structures. So SAR developed first, and settlements followed then. So the, the first thing we used to make was a storage structures, and then your settlement would start, start following up. That was the way we designed, and unfortunately, the modern planners, we do not, I must admit, being a planner, that we do not do any rightful integration of water-sensitive design, but it comes to urban planning. There we have completely failed, and we allow building up legally in floodplains. Uh, so the question is, can we together revive our traditional wisdom and create our own hybrid modern version of water future? Yes or no? We can do, or we completely ignore it and we emulate something else, uh, which may or may not be successful in our own context. Uh, the approach could be this. First, A, accept there is a problem. Acceptance to a problem leads to the next step of solution. So the, you accept the variability, unseasonality, extremities, extreme events. They are there, going to be there, rather more intense. Then augment the water resources from even including all high technology options, low technology options, whatever is there. But catch every drop of water. Every drop of water has to be caught. Revise our update, I mean, our legal codes, drought codes used to exit, but we don't have. And the uh, last drought in Marathwada region, which is, again, one of the worst affected droughts uh, region, um, we don't, uh, the, the state government was a complete, at complete loss as to what to do, and we have trains going in uh, where, with uh, exporting water from one place to the another, and uh, still we, we have not learned from our mistakes. Reduce water usage in all sectors, and I think our, uh, one of our uh, next speakers will speak about, particularly in, in terms of industrial sector, 
uh, benchmark water use and set dynamic targets. We do not know how much we consume. We do not know. Our, our, even the norms of 135 LPCD, 150 LPCD, 75 LPCD, these are all outdated. None of us know. We have all the numbers are guess estimates. Uh, they are bizarre, disastrous. We don't know what we consume. So this, so till you don't know as the adage goes, uh, what gets measured only gets managed. If you do, don't know, you can't do anything about it. We'll keep every year, we'll keep on with different speakers, keep speaking the same scrap thing and nothing is going to happen on the ground. Uh, just few suggestions and possible, these are the likelihood of possible strategies. One thing, uh, I think, I don't know why it's, it's not visible here. Wherein I want to end is monitoring and maintenance, which, which I think next presentation by Arunji will focus on how you can uh, introduce behavioral changes, uh, which is very, very important uh, for any kind of consumption. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was such an intense presentation. We all could actually feel it. Uh, taking the session further, I would like to uh, call upon Professor Arun Kansal, uh, Dean Research Relationship and Head of Department of Regional Water Studies. He has over 23 years of experience in the field of environmental engineering, water resource management, waste management, with a focus on resource recovery and recycling, urban environment and energy environment climate linkages. He has been uh, also served as a lead author of I for IPCC fifth assessment report. Welcome you, sir. It's already there. not coming. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So perplexing possibilities. So here, uh, in my brief talk with you, I will be presenting four perplexing possibilities. First is the distinction or dif subtle difference between water demand and water need, and why Overlooking this difference actually results in breeding inefficiencies in urban water infrastructure. Second is, today's society is not same as that society that was there in 20 years back or 30 years back. And if the society has changed and lifestyles has changed, what does it mean to the water consumption pattern? That is something which has not been captured so far. Third, of course, the use of gadgets at a domestic level. And these use of gadgets are increasingly uh, in India. And these gadgets have its own implications with respect to water as well as energy consumption. And there we see that at times, the goal for water consumption efficiency and the electricity consumption are at conflict with each other at a domestic level. And the fourth is, how the lack of evidences in policy making is crippling uptake of new innovations and penetration of innovations at a fast pace. So these are the four things which I will flag uh, in my brief talk uh, with you. Just a second. How to? So, of. All the urban, of all the material flows in an urban area, two things which are very crucial, which, and also abundance in quantity, is the water flows and energy flows. So in any urban ecosystem, these are the two material which comes in, goes out, and in different forms and uh, thing. And actually, these are provided by public utilities. So urban water utilities provide these services to the residents, so residents at times, do not have to do much in terms of provisioning of these services in the urban context. So uh, 
responsible consumption of this resource is central to achieving key policy goals and in fact uh, in terms of uh, water access and water equitable access to uh, thing is also related to health poverty elevation it is also related to uh, low carbon growth of the cities and reducing urban vulnerabilities to climate change so all these are interlinked and water is central to all these pertinent issues and when we talk of centralized water supply system the underlying assumption is that state need to supply water at a subsidized rate because water is not only an essential but also a basic human needs and also underlying assumption is that consumers use it judiciously so there is a inherent assumption of extended consumer responsibility it is not only the producer's responsibility but extended consumer responsibility which which is which is an assumption which is not happening in the society at present and it is also seen that people behavior towards conservation of resources is dictated by large number of factors we see in the literature that these factors are related to literacy rate education level awareness level but perhaps if these would have played a role we would not have been discussing this issue here what we have seen at least the taking the clues from the energy sector is that a pricing plays a very important role in changing the behavior and second is the risk perception of the consumers so in case of energy we have seen that how the pricing has uh, pricing structure actually has be, uh, made the changes in the behavior of the consumers even to spend extra for energy saving devices and perception of risk is another factor where we have seen the mushrooming uh, uh, this water purifiers at a domestic level uh, and also bottling industries that people are ready to pay more because of the perception of the risk with respect to their health so these two things are actually the main drivers for the change in the uh, people's uh, behavior now there is also a lot which hina has uh, rightly pointed out is that we do not know what is the water requirement of a city now urban planners decide water requirement based on water supply norms and in india i had mentioned these figures in coma because different agencies have come up with a different water supply norms we have central public health and environmental engineering organization under ministry of urban development they have one value bureau of indian standards have another value certain cities again through their own mandate uh, come up with different figures and uh, also we see the differential in the water supply norms with respect to rural water supply and urban water supply within urban sub water supply differential in terms of slums and unauthorized colony with respect to authorized colonies so the entire gamut of water supply norms itself is so much numbers are there and we do not know what is the basis of these numbers and in my own assessment i'd find that these numbers are there since when when i was studying my engineering in early 90s okay so these numbers are still continuing and who has given a wide range from 100 to 200 lpcd now see 100 to 200 lpcd looks a very small range uh, but actually if we should see that this range is actually double the value and if we multiply the population by 16 million we can see there is a huge variation in the water requirement of a city which the engineers work out whether at the time of urban infrastructure planning so the point is that water supply norms itself is a major issue in terms of deciding water efficient water in uh, urban infrastructure because unless we are aware of the real need and this is where the infrastructure is designed based on the perceived water demand so water demand is nothing but these normative values but what city actually needs is different and that is where the problem is that we design infrastructure water infrastructure facilities based on the demand values water needs are different and this breeds in efficiency uh, in in terms of losses and today like for example in delhi there is a 50% loss which is quoted in the literature 50% loss in the uh, water in the urban water supplies so how this 50% loss and still we are able to meet the needs because the demand estimate itself is on a very high side secondly we also have to account that there is a variation in the water uh, needs and we have seen that the variations is used across the countries within the countries and across the cities like for example in the second para i had mentioned given some values for african cities european cities and we see that there is a huge variation in terms of uh, water consumption in various cities 
So the key question is, how does per capita consumption of water at home vary with respect to socioeconomic and demographic status of the household? So if there is a variation across the city, that means this must, may be a driver. And how do coping strategies, because if there is a water scarcity and water stress, people tend to do certain coping strategies, like as I mentioned at, say, water purifiers. So coping strategies for inadequate water supply and doubtful, doubtful quality influence household consumption. And lastly, how does demand of water change by use of modern gadgets? So there is a detailed investigation over a period of two to three years, which I did, and I'm presenting my results based on that. So first is the impact of water consumption choices. Of course, the, the, the font is small size, but uh, I can still point out certain things. Now, with respect to the choices we make with respect to water consumption, we see that there is a variation. If we take a simple activity like bathing, bathing, most of us in India, and in our survey, we find 87% of the population use bucket and mug uh, system for bathing. There, the water consumption per bath is 24.6 liter compared to a bathtub bathing where the water consumption is found to be 38.7 liters. See, this again is a 50% jump. So, so shifting from bucket mug model to a shower system or to a bath system, you, you increase the domestic water consumption to a nearly 50% values. Similarly, the perceived risk of inadequate quality of water, people tend to store water in a different manner. So in some households, there is no domestic water purifier, water no water treatment. So water uh, storage is around 28.3 liters a day. Now, the moment you start doing water treatment, like either filtration or reverse osmosis, even it can increase by a factor of two. And reason why the domestic water purifier increases this uh, uh, consumption, because a stored water has its own shelf value. So normally, what we have seen, the behavioral pattern of the people is that they tend to store water once uh, for the whole day. And maybe towards the evening or next day cycle, the stored water is just thrown out. So in this way of perceived inadequate quality of water actually results in the domestic water consumption by a factor of two. Now, the modern gadgets, which today's lifestyle people are using, actually is reducing water demand. Now, what we have seen that, like for example, two important uh, water consumption activity like uh, washing clothes and dish washing. What we have seen is that the use of modern gadgets have actually reduced the water demand. And here I just want to mention that most of us use running water, uh, tap running water for dishwashing. It is 3.3 liters per minute. And on an average, the duration is 34 minutes, which means that the consumption is around 105 liters per cycle of dishwashing compared to 45 liters for a dishwasher. So the, the modern technology use of gadgets Actually, and same is the case with uh, cloth washing through washing machines. And what we have seen that use of these gadgets reduce water consumption, but at the same time increases the electricity consumption. So that is where I was trying to bring out that if at a domestic level we talk of water use efficiencies, then of course it is likely to increase the electricity consumption. And it is found that on a, on a monthly basis around 300 watt uh, hours of electricity is uh, consumed additionally per person per month. And of course, toilet flushing, the bucket method now, lack of sanitation facilities where that flushing system is not there and buckets are used, the water consumption increases. So two points which from this table I want to mention is that lack of reliability of services and inadequate infrastructure facilities increase water consumption and use of gadgets increase electricity consumption but reduces uh, water consumption. And this is a huge factor and can make that entire water demand at an urban le level to a 40% from the current level. So, yes, this survey is uh, Delhi and it was a detailed survey. Uh, uh, I'm not commenting on the methodology part. Of course, it is all statistically we have analyzed and so values, so, yes, is the certainly. So now we had also tried to look into the how the economic status influences the water demand. And what is shown in this table is comparison between HIG, MIG, and LIG colonies. And what we found is that statistically, there is no difference in the water demand 
amongst these uh, group of uh, people. So the, the theoretical in, th in the literature that economic per capita income increase will result in more water demand is not today's reality. In fact, what we had found that people are shifting to the gadgets not because of the philosophy of water conservation, but because of the philosophy of saving time. So change in the lifestyle today is pushing people to save time, and that is the driver and not the water uh, b philosophy of water consumption. So what we had found is that the water consumption in household is not significantly different with respect to uh, uh, income status, and what the around 76 liter per person per day is the real water need. So if it pool the entire data, this is the 76 liter which is coming out. And if we superimpose the hypothesis that people will, all the people will shift to uh, water saving devices like dishwasher and washing machines, and also will not store water by using RO and this thing, then the real water need is around 70.5 liters. As against the normative value of water demand of 135 liters per capita per day. And this is where our investigation has proved the hypothesis or the thing that even with 50% losses in the water infrastructure, there is no crisis in terms of uh, meeting the daily needs of, uh, of water. Now, in case of slum, the water consumption is around 45 liters. And this consumption is not because they are saving more water, but because they are compromising their water need by resorting to the activities which are unhygienic. For instance, in a dishwasher tap running water, the water consumption is 45 liter per cycle of dishwashing. Whereas in slums, they generally use buckets or tubs where they just rinse the uh, utensils over there where the water consumption is much less, but the quality of the dishwashing is compromised. And same way, uh, they are using community toilets uh, and other things. So there is a shift in the water demand to uh, this. Second thing what we have found is that family size also do not influence much in terms of daily water uh, demand. And actually, up to a family size of four, there is an increase in the uh, per capita water consumption. But after that, it almost stagnant or slightly decrease. Now, what we have found is that today, most of the households spend their time outside their house. And secondly, they outsource water consumption activities outside. That is, an adult on an average is spending 10 hours to 11 hours a day outside their home, which means that they are shifting their domestic water demand to commercial water demand. So we are all there in offices, schools, colleges, and our water demand is shift there, not at the domestic level. Similarly, there is, has been a shift in terms of outsourcing of laundry facilities, more use of packaged food or uh, taking food, especially uh, why the water consumption is very less per, uh, in case of single person family, because he outsources all food needs, dishwashing needs, and laundry needs uh, outside. So again, we have, while we are fixing the water supply norms, we also have to see the, uh, the structure of the demographic pattern and household while deciding this thing, and one should not take a blanket figure uh, in these types of norms. Finally, I just want to flag, so there is a shift, clear-cut shift from domestic to commercial demand. So a, a domestic water demand has shifted to commercial demand, and that also has to be taken in account by the urban planners. Now, increasing trend uh, towards use of gadget also save time, not in terms of triggered by the water saving behaviors. But uh, there is a huge amount of inequity and injustice that exists. So sometimes I wonder that why there is a differential in water supply norm ranging from 40 liters per capita per day to 200 liters per capita per day. And what also find is that injustice in the sense that for an organized settlement like uh, uh, colonies and in urban areas, the municipal bodies are considered as service providers. So they design, operate, maintain, and take the burden of entire infrastructure, whereas for unauthorized colonies like slums and also for rural population, the, the, they are not consumers, but they are beneficiaries. 
And this change in notion from consumer to beneficiaries actually put entire burden of operation and maintenance of the facilities on these people who have low per capita, uh, low uh, uh, affordability capacities. So wherever we have seen that there's a public toilet, there's a user fees. Wherever there's a community tab, there is a user fees. And this is where the, the shift from a consumer to a, uh, to a slum population to a beneficiaries brings a lot of inequity and injustice in urban water systems. And also we see, found that there is a negative correlation between water and electricity savings at a uh, domestic level. But important thing is that, especially in, when it comes to the sanitation, there is a lack of evidence and policy gaps with respect to the impact of soak pits and septic tanks that is going to have on environment. Because of the lack of evidence, even in the Swajh Bharat mission for all decentralized toilets, the soak pit and septic tanks continue to remain as a main stage uh, technology to uh, handle septage. And the problem is that what we are doing by these sock pits and septic tanks are we are shifting surface pollution to the subsurface level. So what is the conse consequence of this in a long term is not clear. And problem is that nowadays we are talking of public-private partnership model. And this, what this model is bringing out is that the, all the things are measured in numbers, number of toilets, number of uh, facilities. And this actually, uh, uh, actually neglected the entire cycle of the septage management toilets is not just uh, one facility, but also the fecal sludge, uh, which has to be uh, there. So the entire CSR funding is again measured in terms of numbers rather than the entire cycle of the septage management. Now, what is important today is that we also need to change the thinking in terms of infrastructure monitoring from sheer numbers, but in terms of outcomes. So why not we talk of evaluation of Swajh Bharat Mission or urban water supply services in terms of reduction in number of waterborne diseases rather than saying number of toilets and number of facilities. So what is required is that the Ministry of Health and Health Sector has to be integrated with respect to water sector and they, are, they cannot be inseparable. In fact, what we found is that 80% of the diseases uh, mortality and morbidity is because of the waterborne. So why we have two separate ministries, why they cannot be? So that the moment these are uh, uh, integrated, then obviously there is a whole difference in the approach towards the water supply and sanitation infrastructure. And finally, what we also found is that because uh, all the urban water supply engineers have to follow go IS codes for their design, and if they do not follow the IS codes and tomorrow anything happens, then they will be at fault because you have not followed the certain norms codes. And you, so the point is that our engineers are not insulated from the risk of failures. And if they are not insulated from the risk of failures, then how the universities and research organizations, new innovations can be uptake in the new infrastructure because most of the funding in water supply and sanitation is through the government. And government engineers are guided and dictated by codes and uh, normative values. So there is a huge gap between innovation and, uh, and transferring these innovations to the codes of practices for these engineers. And unless, unless this is there, the most of the innovations remain at the laboratory scale and there, there is, cannot be uptake. And of course, there is also a need to come up with a comprehensive guidelines to protect groundwater, especially bacteriological pollution and diffuse pollution, which is not existing. So these are some of the perplexing possibilities I want to flag. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such a stimulating uh, experience sharing and everything. Uh, our last speaker for the session is Ms. Tushara Shankar, GM Head, CSR at United Breweries. Ms. Shankar has 15 years of diverse experience with corporate entities, international non-profit and consulting organizations. At United Breweries Limited, she leads the CSR initiative across 21 breweries. Her experience of working with multiple partners across varied geographies has culminated in implementation of major water conservation projects in drought prone areas of Rajasthan and Maharashtra and safe drinking water projects in several states. Uh, United Brewery strives to be a water neutral company by 2025 and most of the CSR initiatives are designed to meet this goal. Requ request you ma'am to take the session forward.
Thank you so much for the intro introduction and uh, good afternoon, rather evening, everyone. Uh, here we have had such fantastic panelists already speaking before me. And uh, I am the person here from a corporate slash industry, and I'm not carrying a PPT for a change. So I, I'm going to speak, and I hope I c I'm able to keep you interested with the kind of work we do to contribute towards this entire issue of water stress in our own little way. So she's already said United Breweries wants to be a water neutral company by 2025, which is a huge goal for a beer company when we manufacture beer. And uh, also, I come from a city of, of Bangalore, which is uh, rated as one of the cities suffering from huge water stress. I, I, I'm sure all of you have read that report, which said after Cape Town, the city which is going to face the largest water stress is, is Bangalore. So that's the city I represent. Plus, I represent a completely water-dependent, water-intensive industry. We cannot manufacture beer without water. It, it, the primary raw material for us is water. And if there is no water or shortage of water, the first thing that happens is we don't get water. So we are pretty serious about it. We realize how important it is for our business. While I am a corporate uh, you know, CSR professional, I have done my master's in social work. So I'm equally concerned about the community as well. So it has to work as a win-win situation between the business and the community. And that's where we have pitched our, our CSR. So, uh, you know, we do, besides, you know, uh, as I said, I already mentioned earlier that for if there is a water stress anywhere, wherever we have our brews, we have it across 21 locations in the country because we, we have about 52% of the market share in this country and we produce a huge amount of beer, clearly. And um, therefore, if any part suffers from a little drought or some water shortage, the first thing that happens is our water gets cut. They say breweries re require a lot of water, beverage companies. For us, for a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi, we, we all pretty much fall under the same category. So that, that water is cut because that is the most non-essential thing as per the government. So we are at a huge risk when there is a water, water scarcity. It, it kind of affects the sustainability of our business. And if, you know, if a brewery is stopped for 15 days, it's a huge business loss. Um, that we are very serious. We understand the implications of this entire uh, water stress issue on us. And therefore, we have set a goal of ourselves to be water, positive, water neutral by 2025. And right now, at, at, at the end of March of 2018, we have about 53% water positive. So we kind of put back 23 lakh kiloliters of water every year, which is huge. But we have a long way to go because we consume about 43 lakh kil water every year. And I'm, I'm openly talking about it. Industry requires water. I mean, it cannot do without water. While industry gets highlighted also for a lot of water, I genuinely believe that there is agriculture also that we all need to together look at, where there is a huge amount of water wastage happening and a lot of us are not really considering that as an, we are bound by, industry itself is bound by a lot of regulations. Government controls it. So, and we, there's no soft corner from the government for industry. So we are rule bound, we try and reduce our wastage. Some companies are progressive, want to do it on their own. Some are bound by certain rules and therefore they have to do it. But altogether, they are forced to reduce the water um, consumption, whereas there are sectors who, have, who the government has been a little lenient with, where the water requirement is much higher. Only 4% of water in the entire, uh, that, that India requires, only 4% is used by industries. So it's not that industries use a lot of water as it is assumed. So here we, uh, in our breweries, we have a four hour strategy of reduce. He also uh, already uh, spoke about uh, reuse. So we reduce wherever the leakages are. Our breweries are huge. If you see them, they are huge, really large. And if we ensure each point has no leakage, that itself reduces a lot of uh, water use in our context. Uh, we reuse as much water as possible. So in the production, we naturally need, need to use only fresh water. But wherever else, in the cleaning processes, our bottles are reused every time. So they have to be cleaned properly. So that, you know, if tomorrow as a beer consumer, if you get a foreign object inside the bottle, you'll have a complaint. So, you know, that it is thoroughly clean, but all of that water, that the cleaning process, we use only reused water. So that, you know, there's no fresh water wastage happening there. Uh, we have used uh, state, uh, we have put state of the art machines in our breweries so that we, you know, do it at the minimum possible water. And, uh, you know, the, all of this we do within the fence, within our breweries. And outside the fence, we do recharge. We are very serious ab about our, uh, our water recharge, groundwater recharge. And we have, we have make, 
been making a lot of efforts towards that. So, uh, you know, in the last eight years, seven years, eight years back, we used to require seven liters of water per liter of beer. And with our efforts, now we require about three liters of water per liter of beer. That's which is a huge change that's going to impact. And in future, we are going to continue to work on this process of making it more and more water efficient. Uh, that, and then um, within the brewery, we set up rainwater harvesting structures to make sure every, every drop of water that falls in that space is uh, saved. And outside the brewery, we have a variety of programs. We have watershed development initiatives. We have rejuvenation of water bodies like ponds and lakes, the, you know, which come under the uh, Gram Panchayat uh, locations, wherever our breweries are. Uh, we do rooftop rainwater harvesting in a very, very big way. We promote it. We have done integrated natural resource management in, in uh, places like Rajasthan. So along with all of these, you know, very mostly technical kind of interventions in which you need to in involve civil engineers and all of that. We have a huge component of community mobilization, ensuring that you know it's a win-win situation, as I said, for both the community and the company. Company could probably achieve its goal of 100% much faster, because it's all about mostly putting money if you only have to do the technical work. But here, taking the community along and making sure it's sustainable is where it takes you. That is how you become water neutral. If you do not take the community along, who is going to sustain that water body for you, which is not within your premises. It is outside, so it's, it's with the community unless they see the benefit of that particular body and how it, it helps them, they are not going to be able to take care of it, maintain it, sustain it on a long-term basis. So that's where the community mobilization aspect uh, comes in. So we uh, already, uh, you've mentioned that we work in um, a variety of places where our breweries are. We have uh, large water conservation initiatives in Dharu Heda in Haryana. Uh, in uh, Bhivadi, in Rajasthan, we have an integrated natural resource management project for a particular community which had no livelihood option. You know, they were into illegal mining and all of that. It's, it's a, uh, there's this whole region which is called Mewat, which is extremely backward. And uh, uh, it is dominated by a particular community they, who have no source of income otherwise. And they, their lands, from independence, they had never tilled their lands. So we, did, we had helped them do land leveling and all of that and helped them, you know, parallel to our water conservation efforts. They got a complete livelihood linkage along with it. We developed orchards for them. Um, then we, in Ludhiana and Patiala, we are working with Terry, because one is uh, uh, an organizing partner here. And we are doing, we have adopted eight water bodies and we are rejuvenating them along with uh, excellent uh, partnership with the community and the panchayat, the local uh, government body. Uh, in Aurangabad, which is always known for, you know, a, a lot of industries. If you go into Aurangabad, you see a whole lot of industries and factories there. Why? Because at one point of time, that place had excellent water. And it was known for its water. But in today's time, it suffers from um, immense uh, drought. And um, where, which is where, again, we have done complete watershed development. And we are working with, very closely with the community. There are some villages which were completely dependent on tanker supplies for water. And uh, now they are able to at least take care of 50% of their water needs, So, which in itself is a big achievement. While pursuing our own goal of being water neutral, the community is getting benefited in uh, this particular way. In Palakkad in Kerala, uh, Professor Hina mentioned about Palakkad. I agree. One year it suffers from drought. The other year it has floods. And this year it was terrible. So you know, uh, in Palakkad, we have while we have rejuvenated a water body, a large water body, it that also kind of got you know the, the check dams and all of that that we had made. Some of them got damaged in the uh, recent floods that happened. Then we said, you know, you know, there was a lot of pressure from the local government. We, our kind of industries get a lot of pressure from the local government to put in money into relief work as they see right. So, you know, you put money in the relief work. And while there were a lot of people coming in for uh, helping out doing relief work, whenever disaster happens um, in India, there's a lot of chaos because people do not know who to go to and where to put the money. Uh, governments just keep asking for money and do not keep a check and balance of what is going where and how much is required and so on. So we said, no, we are not going to do relief work here. While we are based here, we know that there's a requirement. We can see a lot of people doing it. We would lo look at a climate resilient program for Palakkad. We're ki currently working on a uh, long-term program, which is, which is going to make sure that that place doesn't suffer as badly from any natural disaster in future and less natural disasters happen in itself. So that's like a very long-term sustainable perspective that industry is doing and in which you know you need the support of the government a lot of times we are like you know in in a city like bangalore 
we while we believe that in the south india the governments are slightly more you know accommodative they give us better uh, kind of a, yeah, yeah I, I live in south india and yeah so and and we we wanted and and bangalore is known for its lakes so and a lot of them are like very spoiled we all the time your news they're burning and all the belandur lake is one example so, but we tried to adopt a couple of lakes and there were so many authorities that we had to go to that we had to give up we said we can't do anything in bangalore urban because corporates do not have the patience to run after the government for two years they would want to <laughs> You know, they're goal-oriented, they're efficient. They do not want to pursue the government for something that is important to the government. So, you know, we gave up and we now adopt, we adopted a lake in rural Bangalore because it's much easier to work with village panchayats than urban municipal bodies. Mm -hmm. I am, you are an urban planner, but <laughs> with due respect, it's extremely, there's a lake development authority, there's a KLCDA, there's a whole lot of things. It's, it's really perplexing. <laughs> it's, it's that uh, difficult. So, um, yeah. Uh, then we work with a lot of non-profits, very good non-profit organizations. We are not able to do this on our own. We are not really experts on the uh, community mobilization aspects. While we have a vision, we, uh, there are a lot of partners who, ha who helped us achieve this vision. We have Terry as a partner. We have United Way of Bangalore as a partner. We have uh, a smaller organization called Akhil Bharatiya Gramin Uthan Sansthan as a partner, doing grassroots level work. We have Dilasa Janvikas Pratishthan in Aurangabad as a partner. Then we have a Sir Sayyar Trust, which is helping us work in Bhivadi. So all of this put together, we have a, like a really robust system of managing our water conservation projects to be able to touch this large issue that our country is facing in our minute ways. I, you know, personally here, I learned a lot of things uh, from the panelists today uh, into a lot of person because we read what, what comes on, on the web and then, you know, I am not an expert uh, in the water space at all. But, uh, you know, this uh, has been a great learning experience. And, you know, again, I would also like to touch upon the traditional know-how that you are talking about. In a lot of our projects, what we have seen is while there is a lot uh, of, uh, you know, earlier those water bodies were functional, being taken care of, suddenly the, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, they've stopped maintaining those water bodies. And that's why that particular area is suffering from uh, water issues. So we always want to work you know we try to understand from the local uh, people as to where was where are the channels where are the what where is the water flowing from you know despite having all the maps and the technological uh, interventions there we always ensure that that buy in is there and so we make sure that it's a you know it's a marriage between the technological uh, development in today's world advances with the traditional know how present in the communities to be able to look uh, at a water conservation project. That's uh, mostly what our approach is. And uh, yeah, as from an industry, and I can voice the industry concerns, I always believe that, you know, we need to work along with the agricultural community in a big way. Maybe, you know, because industries are efficient in their water management, maybe they could, uh, you know, bring that know-how and efficiencies to the agricultural sector and support at least the agriculture. But most of the industries are linked to some or the other agricultural produce. So if at all they kind of, they, they contribute to those particular farmers, that is going to go a long way in uh, solving uh, this uh, entire issue of water stress which is present. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your experience and motivating us. Uh, I would request if there's some discussion that we wish to take upon or we can uh, maybe have a question answer as we Yeah, I think it'd be appropriate to take some questions. You've heard from the, the speakers. Uh, Hina yeah. emphasised how we need to find a hybrid way um, and mapped out five steps to the approaches with accept the changing reality, augment supplies where possible, revise codes, particularly building codes, to avoid the construction on wetlands, but also uh, revising the water um, consumption numbers, which uh, Arun then went on to expand on how a lot of our assumptions there are wrong. Um, and, uh, and then Tushara talked about how industries are implementing some of those five approaches, um, fixing leaks, reusing water where possible, using the water efficient technologies, which is responsible as Arun indicated for reducing the demand in the home. 
and that, uh, um, and then also um, recharging aquifers, and then working with communities. And the community and the social aspect is the key to a lot of this. So I'm sure you have some questions and some perspectives to, uh, to share, so we'll open it up. about so many uh, indexes that are available in India. And you've come up with, like, based on your studies, something around 63.9, the overall average for domestic usage. So uh, what I look over here is something like thermal comfort studies. They were always trying to fix uh, appropriate temperature for the indoor. So what I'm asking you is, is there not a possibility for us to have an adaptive range, you know, for LPCD? Because till now, uh, in your presentation, in all the standards, all we talk about is one universal value of LPCD. And nowhere in the standards is there a conversation about an adaptive range, just like thermal comfort. Because thermal comfort depends upon 12 factors, at least six that we can count. And over here, we just talked that water also depends upon so many factors. So is there no possibility of having some kind of an adaptive range or an ad adaptive model for LPCD calculation? Okay, uh, so first, a little correction. The value of 63 which you have seen is including slums current consumption level, but the real water need is around 75 liters per capita per day. And with all water use efficiency, efficient methods, uh, perhaps it will be 70.5. So that is in terms of numbers. Now, in terms of, actually, I, I t uh, give you the trigger behind or motivation behind taking up such a uh, research was that in the year 2015, and if you are from Delhi, you may remember that Aam Admi Party come up with a policy of giving free water up to 20,000 liters, and after that it will be. So the lot of debate at that time was that on what basis this 20,000 liter has come out, okay? And there was no ready answers. Now, from this study, even if we take 75 liters per person, and for an average family size of four, which works out to be 300 liters per household, so in, in, in a month, it is around 9,000 liters. So we can say that 10,000 liters is your adaptive capacity. And beyond that, what is being consumed is actually your inefficiencies, whether it is leaking taps or leaking uh, uh, continuously running flushes or not using water saving devices. So my answer to that is that for a household of four, the comfortable range uh, for, I would say, subsidized water supply is 10,000 liters per month. And beyond that, of course, uh, it is inefficient use of water. Four standards, you know, you mentioned four yeah. standards. Yeah. Like yes. Yes, 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 yes. And municipal, municipalities yes. have their own yes. in various yeah. cities. So uh, is there any authority in India that is working on creating some kind of a standard which is adaptive or which is, means, which, which everybody follows? Okay. So basically, let me go a little more behind the story of these standards. There are two things. One is that the entire design of the urban water infrastructure if it is a sewer system, then there is also minimum flows required for a sewer system to function. Okay, so many a times these water supply norms are also dictated by the fact that whether you have a decentralized water, wastewater treatment facilities or a centralized and the drainage system is whether open drain or a sewer system. So a lot of local factors are going to play. I would still say that the design of water supply systems can continue little more because there is also commercial demand and other things. But what is important is the water pricing. Water pricing is something which we can, we have, somewhere we have to make a balance between a subsidy, uh, considering water as a basic need, and luxury. And water pricing is something which will dictate consumers' behavior uh, towards uh, water consumption pattern. So uh, when it comes to design of water supply infrastructure, I think the major factor there is the energy considerations. Because if you are from engineering and if you just apply Bernoulli's principle, if you increase the diameter, your energy pumping energy demand reduces drastically. So there, perhaps in that water system design, lot of other factors has a dominant role. 
compared to just simple amount of water. There in the in the front. Uh, what is water neutral? And difference between water uh, demand and water need. Uh, I think I have uh, mentioned that water demand is something which engineers in the water supply agencies consider for designing their water infrastructure. Okay, so they say for, say for example, if new settlement is going to come, so they assume as per their master plan that two lakh population is going to come. So we need water supply of two lakhs multiplied by normative values. So that is what they in their parlance it is considered as water demand of the thing. Water need is something which is required for survival, for as a basic human need, which is the actual consumption which people makes. So, so far in the engineering codes, water need as a term do not figure as of today. Okay. Uh, water neutral. I'll speak about that. Sir. Water neutral in an industry, from an industry perspective, is putting back as much water as you're consuming. So if I'm consuming, let's say, 53 lakh liters, 53 uh, lakh kL, kiloliters of water, I am putting back that much water back into the ground. So groundwater recharge, I'm, if I'm doing of 53 lakh uh, kiloliters, then I can call myself water neutral. Uh, should it be in the same periphery or suppose I am taking water from this uh, area and refueling somewhere else, whether, where it is required in fact or not? No, it should be ideally in the same periphery, in the same okay. watershed. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. And, uh, the next table back. We've got a question up the back there. Yeah, my name is uh, Yusuf. I'm from Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Greg uh, Leslie. Uh, uh, Greg, uh, I've noticed that uh, uh, a lot of... Uh, Interesting startups uh, around water efficiency uh, seem to be coming out of Australia. Uh, I mean, for the last seven, eight years, I've been attending these conferences. And I always find that the Australian companies are usually front runners or the Australian startups do really well in terms of water-related startups. Uh, like last year, I, I, I came across somebody who's, who's selling this liquid that you can put on a lake that forms a layer and reduces evo evo evaporation. The year before that, I met somebody who does uh, underground uh, drip drip systems, they put a fabric underground and which, which you know, dissipates water below. So uh, what do you think Australia is doing that maybe we could do in India uh, that could bring about this kind of a transformation in, in entrepreneurship and, and thinking? Is it, is it the water pricing or is it something else that we are missing uh, that Australia is doing? Uh, if you could put some there. That, that's a, a, a very good question. Um, so on a couple of levels, there has been a climate I think that has made people aware of the importance of water. Um, at the basic level, uh, agriculture is their second largest export industry. And at any given time, a part of the country will be in drought, much like India. Um, but because of the, the, the size of the population, the, 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 the drought conditions are, are reported in the cities. So there's an awareness. And then in the last big drought that affected the east coast of Australia, that precipitated a, a, a generational investment in, in water infrastructure, close to $16 billion was spent on the east coast of Australia, building those desalination plants and some water transfer pipelines and some water reuse. That really galvanised the industry and the, 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 the people coming through. It, it coincided with when I left the private sector and, and started teaching at the university, and I know that our, our graduate numbers swelled, and the jobs that they went to, the water industry was taking them in. So it was a it was a it was a real acute awareness. You have to remember the city of Sydney came very close, to, uh, sorry, the city of Brisbane rather came very close to running out of water. The city of Goulburn came very close, which is the next city to Canberra, the capital. So that sort of thing freed up money. Um, the banks got involved because these projects needed to be financed. Um, and that had, a, that had a real trickle down effect. The consulting engineering firms and the construction firms 
some of their business, um, you know, th that, that sector grew and, and activity spun out of that. Now, I'm not sure how, how to, to, to uh, tr transfer that, how to create that in India. I, I know that those same companies that were heavily invested in water a few years ago are now heavily invested in transport because transport is the next big, or is the big issue in our cities. We've got, we're approaching gridlock with a lot of the traffic. So that's the next big area. Um, at the government level, the water reforms, which took a good nearly 30 years to work through, was very central to the whole idea that water has become, that there are now markets for water. So the drip irrigators are a good example um, for, for where they are innovating for the, the, uh, um, the agricultural sector. The other area that they're beginning to innovate in that sector is the blockchain. Um, because the water has to be, tra we have to have effective water markets. That requires effective metering. And, so, and the distances, geographically, some of the distances are the same as India, in, in fact, longer. So the whole metering market is coming up. So, so I think those, those are, that, that, they're the conditions. How you begin to, to, imp to create those conditions in India, um, crisis, you know, is, is always two parts of the character, crisis and opportunity. So that, that helps, unfortunately. Um, so. Could you also throw some light on how much uh, uh, money does an average household in, in say, central Sydney uh, pay for a cubic meter of, uh, of uh, municipal supplied or, or government supplied water? Okay, so in... in Sorry to interrupt. Yep. Uh, but can we take these uh, questions over the tea? Sh absolutely. So that but I'm the short answer is about a dollar. So sorry 40. to interrupt. A dollar? A dollar forty. Dollar forty. Okay. So I would like to thank all the speakers for a very thought-provoking thought session that we had here. I request Professor Leslie to kindly present a small token of appreciation to our speakers. First of all, I would like to call uh, Professor Hina Zia. A round of applause, please. Uh, Professor Arun Kansil. <laughs> Mrs. Shara Shankar. A warm round of applause, please. These paintings showcase Gond art, which comes with the belief that a good image brings good luck. The Gonds are major tribal communities of central India. The artists have used natural colors derived from charcoal, colored soil, plant sap, leaves, and cow dung. This mystical art form is created by putting together dots and lines. Now I would request Ms. Shabnam Basi to uh, uh, felicitate our esteemed moderator for the session. <laughs> 